Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day. We are counting down to the next VRIC January 21st and 22nd, 2024. Stay tuned for tickets. But of course, we are bringing you great guests each and every week. And today's guest is the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom report, which can be found at gloomboomdoom.com. It's Mark Faber. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. And good day to all the viewers. Well, good day to you as well. Um, I think people are going to get a lot from this conversation. And I want to start with your recently released monthly market commentary. And in it, you noted the factors of poor conditions in the U.S. commercial property market, affordability issues, a global economy which is contracting and inflationary pressures. The conclusion could be that stocks would likely decline further in the years to come. So I'm wondering how much more downside do you see to come in the broad markets? And are there any areas where you see stability, such as perhaps the commodity space, precious metals? Is there any shelter from the storm up ahead or are we just going to see a crash across all, all asset classes? Yeah, that's a good question about the shelter. <laughs> we have to select it very carefully. But the point I want to make, and this every investor has to understand, uh, there are two equations. One is prices uh, move up in nominal terms, but decline in real terms. Let's say uh, your salary, it could be going up in nominal terms like uh, your boss gives you every year a 10% increase, but actually in reality it's going down because the cost of living is going up by 15% per annum. So in real terms, you're losing 5%. And that many people don't uh, consider uh, that in nominal terms, your portfolio could be going up but because the central banks have decided to destroy the, the value of money, that in real terms, the portfolio goes down. In other words, you look at the 1966 in the US to 1982, the market more or less moved sideways around 1,000 on the Dow Jones. In 81, 82, it dropped briefly to less than 800 in August 1982, at which time it was down 70% in real terms from the 66 high. So an investor, you could have said, oh, my portfolio is okay. I'm the same level than 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But in real terms, he lost essentially money. And then another component we would have to add into the whole equation are dividends. But let's oh, leave no. that out for the time being. But it is possible that the stocks could go up or move sideways because the Fed, uh, you have to understand this, the Fed has tightened. It has increased interest rates. But interest rates, say the 10 years Treasury note, is now at less than 3.4%, okay? So for 10 years, you will get 3.4% in US dollars. But quite frankly, I don't know anyone in the world whose cost of living is only going up by 3.4%. In, in Europe, they just produced uh, the, the index of uh, inflation for food. It was up 15% year on year. 15%. The wealthy people don't care because the food component, if you earn $100 million a year, this would be the minimum salary for someone who is wealthy. The food component is not going to be more than 1% maximum. He would have, even with 1%, a million dollars a year, he would have to eat the best vacuum beef and drink the best champagnes every day and smoke the best cigars. But for the poor people, I mean, the poor people, it's all relative. But for the working class, like you and me, 
uh, if food prices go up, and especially if beverage prices go up, if alcohol goes up, it is a meaningful expenditure. Right. And so do you think that well, well, I want to get your thoughts on the precious metals and how you might see them performing in the case of a broader market crash? And do you see gold, for example, protecting purchasing power in the case of this persistent inflation? I have advocated for the last 40 years that every responsible citizen should have his own uh, currency reserves, his fo own foreign exchange reserves in the form of gold, silver, and platinum. Because and this people ha don't seem to understand that nobody can trust a central banker. They're all a bunch of liars, incompetent people who have no clue about what is happening in the real world. These are academics. None of them has ever managed a business. None of them has ever started a business. They are all uh, what you would call intellectuals, intellectual morons. They went to fine universities then they got the job at the Fed through some connections, usually political connections. And then the worst people that this is in politics, is it is like this. The worst get promoted. So you end up at the top with completely incompetent uh, leaders. You look at the last three Fed chairmen, uh, chairpersons in the U.S., all complete nobodies. You look at the ECB. Draghi was smart, but he was devious. He pushed interest rates down, and he was politically motivated to keep the EU together. And under him, interest rates were negative. In history of mankind, I've never seen negative interest rates. <laughs> it is an expropriation of decent people who have saved during their lifetime and put some money aside. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I want to put the question of, you know, a financial crisis that it looks like the world is finding itself in, potentially a, a global phenomenon. And I'm wondering if you see this as, as a global phenomenon, or do you see, I guess it's similar to the last question about shelter from the storm. Are there any parts of the world that are more resilient to the effects of a recession, or is this going to be spread out across the world? Well, it's a good question, and, and I'd like to answer this the following way. As you know, in the last, say, 10 years, so following 2009, uh, the central banks in the Western world printed money. And as a result of this printing of money, and artificially, and this again, I need to point out, it was artificially low interest rates mm. engineered by central banks with the sole reason to push up asset prices. In other words, it favored the wealthy people at the expense of ordinary people whose affordability went down. You understand? If property prices go up like a rocket in Seattle and San Francisco, Ordinary people who are saving money and young people cannot afford to buy these properties, period. So this is the policy that they embarked upon. But when money is free, in other words, interest rates are next to zero, you get also a lot of stupid companies coming up. If interest rates are 12% per annum, and you and I, we start the business, then we have to earn 12% uh, per annum just to pay the interest on the loans and so forth. But if interest rates are at zero, you and I, we can start any company and never pay, you know, we can essentially run the company endlessly as long as interest rates are next to zero. And here I have to point out who the great beneficiaries of these policies were, governments, the socialists who, this is a creeping socialism, 
like a cancer in that finances the expansion of destructive bureaucracy at the expense of hardworking uh, entrepreneurs. And if there is no economic growth, you don't have to ask for a long time, you know, why and this and so. You can point out it is because the government is so big there cannot be any growth. No, not only cannot there be any growth, there must be a contraction because whatever the government touches, it Fs up. Yes, I completely agree with that. I, I want to shift to the banking sector really quickly here yeah. um, because obviously we've seen we've seen weakness in the regional banking sector in the United States, a number of banks a failing. Collapse, in not weakness. A collapse. <laughs> yes, and and we're seeing First Republic being the latest to fail and get acquired by J.P. Morgan. Something doesn't feel right about all of this consolidation happening in the banking sector, where we're seeing smaller regional banks fail and the big, too big to fail banks such as J.P. Morgan stepping in and consolidating power, consolidating capital. Is is there any danger in in this sort of trend that's occurring in terms of you were talking about governments expanding their power, centralization of power? Is that also something you could see happening in the banking sector in America? Uh, in every industry, if you look at uh, the whole COVID fraud uh, and uh, the way governments reacted to it, it destroyed small businessmen. I give you an example. I mean, I'm not criticizing the Thai government nor the, <laughs> the Thai king because I could be going to jail otherwise. But uh, the small shops were asked to close down and so forth, but not 7-Eleven, which is owned by one of the wealthy uh, Thai tycoons. And so actually some people did benefit from the reaction or the policies implemented by incompetent uh, but uh, dictatorial, democratically elected governments. This is something every citizen must ask himself how is it possible that we were taught at school democracy is uh, the best system because it is free and what you have is despotic governments like you have in canada <laughs> did you invite him to the vancouver resource uh, conference <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it's it's very funny you should you should mention that because the the reason I'm in the Balkans right now is because I I left Canada in in October of 2021 when Justin Trudeau was reelected um and uh, and got out of the country because I saw what was happening there and um it, it was an excellent choice the Balkans is so much more free um than Canada is so there are parts of the world for those who are who are looking to maybe leave jurisdictions like Canada. There are parts of the world that offer more bodily autonomy and individual freedom. So I think that's very important for people to consider. Um, I want to shift to the trend of de-dollarization, where we're starting to see nations trade for energy, for example, outside of the US dollar. Is this a trend that you see being impactful moving forward? Is it being blown out of proportion? You know, you've got gold bugs saying this is going to be the death of the dollar. Um, others saying the US dollar is much more resilient than that. What, what's your take on it? Well, I, I think we, there is an answer to everything that is short term and long term. Uh, near term, I don't think the dollar will collapse, but other people think it will collapse. Uh, but uh, my sense is that the dollar has become a bit oversold and that there are too many searches on Google <laughs> about the de-dollarization of the world. But the trend is there. You have to be brain damaged if you're Russia, China, India, Brazil or any country to keep a single dollar in reserves with the Fed in America because they may take it away. They took it away from the Taliban. The poorest countries where there is starvation, the Americans, they take the, their assets away. 
I mean, it's hard to believe. They go around the world and talk about human rights and this and that and freedom. And one of the most impoverished people where actually people are starving, they take the reserves away. Yeah. So I, I think nations are starting to wake up to that fact, right? That yes, they need to be the, holding the something other than the U.S. dollar. Today, the central banks bought on two occasions significant uh, quantities of gold. Between 1960 and 1971, before the dollar depreciation was initiated, in August 1971, under President Nixon, when they closed the gold windows. And now, in the last two years, central banks around the world have again been accumulating gold. I'm not asking anyone to believe that gold will shoot up right away and so forth. Uh, if you compare gold to other commodities, like, say, agricultural commodities, Gold is not that cheap, or it's relatively expensive compared to platinum and silver. But as a long term, if wealth preservation is your ambition, if the purchasing power of your dollar is important to you, if you don't own any gold, uh, I don't know who can help you. Then you deserve to be impoverished. Yes, yes. So ke keeping on that line of preserving wealth and perhaps even finding areas for opportunity in the current economic environment, do you see any other assets aside from what you've mentioned? You've mentioned platinum, silver and gold, perhaps other other assets in the commodity space, or is this a time to more play defense and just preserve wealth as opposed to trying to build wealth? <laughs> I think it's time to preserve wealth, quite frankly. But in preserving wealth, you may have to take some aggressive moves and you may have to take uh, insurance policies. Let's say we can agree today that commercial properties are not particularly attractive because of various factors. Uh, some governments, they deliberately want to destroy inner cities. These are mostly progressive Democrats. They sit in New York and in Chicago, in Seattle and in San Francisco. All these policies are designed to kill businesses in these regions. And so you have people packing their bags and moving out because in these cities, as wealthy people leave, the tax rate will go up. So they leave and they go to states that are freer. They're not entirely free, but they are freer. They go to Texas, they go to Florida. And uh, so real estate is very fragmented. You understand? Maybe your real estate in San Francisco will go down a lot. But it can go up a lot in, say, Tennessee, in uh, Nashville, or in, in Miss, uh, Memphis, mm -hmm. and so forth. And uh, then you also have a factor that is important to consider. 50 years ago, when I started to work, you had to be in a financial center if you were in the financial service industry. So I had to be in New York, or Zurich, or Hong Kong, or London, and so forth. Nowadays, you sit in Montenegro and I sit in Chiang Mai and we have our Bloomberg machine. We can trade and uh, invest as well as someone else who is sitting in a financial center. And we can do that at a much lower cost. So if people talk about real estate and trends, I can tell you, if you go to Europe, you go to Portugal, to Spain, Italy, I mean, Sicily belongs to Italy, but I rank it separately because it's a little bit a different cat. cat. Uh, and you go to the Balkan countries like uh, Croatia and where you sit in Montenegro. You can go into small villages. You can get a property for almost nothing. In some Italian, even in Switzerland, there are some villages 
they will give you the property. But you have to live there and you have to maintain it. What's up, guys? Quick break. My name is Jay Martin. I'm the CEO of Cambridge House and the host of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. I wanted to quickly point your attention to a link right beneath this video where you can subscribe to our new weekly newsletter. If you want to better understand the minds of the best investors in the resource space, subscribe to this newsletter. I author it personally every Sunday and I love writing it. Hit that link below to subscribe. All right, back to the interview. That's a really good point. And actually, another one of the reasons why I came to this part of the world as housing gets so incredibly unaffordable in places like you've mentioned in, in the United States, as well as in Canada, the, the housing prices are absolutely insane. There is great opportunity in uh, in countries like this, where even, you know, for 100,000 euros, you can get a really nice property. And, and if you go to certain smaller villages, as you mentioned, it only goes down from there. So that that's a really good point. And I, I want to just have you expand on that trend of people moving outside of places like New York due to rising crime, high taxes, inept politicians. How do you see this trend developing further? Is the growing authoritarianism in Western countries going to lead to more of an exodus from from places like New York and, and Canada up ahead, do you think? Yes, I believe so. But I'm not sure whether the authoritarian leader who will take over one day power, I mean, the totalitarian leader will be leaning to the right or to the left. I don't think it matters that much because uh, leaning to the right is Mussolini. Hitler and leaning to the left is Lenin and the Marxist countries. So both options are not particularly desirable, you understand? And uh, but, but the trend is towards that. In my, in my opinion, the deep state, <coughs> or some people in government, they actually they want, want to create a horrible environment with crime, where people will be prepared to accept a strong leader who said, I will now clean up the crime scene, but I need power. And so the people will happily relinquish their freedom in order to get uh, state subsidies like a basic income and so forth and so forth. And you move into the totalitarian, what uh, Belloc called it the servile state, okay? <laughs> this is the servile state. This is what we have in Western democracies. Nobody dares to challenge the government. Yes, and, and speaking of which... I mean, the truckers, go ahead. The, at least in Canada, I can say the truckers, they were courageous people. All of them should get the Medal of Honor. Instead, they're penalized, and the people that supported them are penalized. What kind of a system is this? The system is sick. Yes, and that's and, why I say you should. You you is not you should. You must own some precious metals. But the big question is: these idiots who locked down people. This is the first lockdown in history. These idiots, they, they can take it away. They can take your assets away through taxation and through emergency measures. They can say, "Oh, gold ownership is negative," and uh, for the the community and so forth. So you have to tender our, your goal. So you have to diversify. And I would say this, if I were uh, living in the American axis of power, which includes the US, Canada, and Britain, they're all, they're all the same government and NATO similar. Diversification is to keep money outside of these countries. In the de-dollarization countries. <laughs> yes, and, and I think diversification of, you know, places to live as well makes a lot of sense. I know you're going to be speaking at an upcoming event, Nomad Capitalist Live. That, that That's a channel that I, I follow, and uh, I've, I've actually been interviewed on their channel as well. And they're all about diversifying, getting residence permits, trying to get second passports, so that if things really go wrong and go south in the country you're in, at least you have some options there. So I think that's important too. So I want to just ask what you think was at the heart of politicians in the Western world 
um, being so you could call it downright fascist. In, if you look at a place like Canada, they're seizing bank accounts of people who who disagree with them. How is it that so much of society actually embraced that in the Western world? You talked about the truckers deserving medals in Canada. Well, the fact is a large popul- portion, it could be the majority of Canadian citizens were against the truckers. They, they, they were on the side of the government and applauding the government at sending police to shut them down. How does that sort of mentality get into society? And, and more importantly, how can we get it out? Is this just is this just going to take decades as, as time goes on? The next generations, hopefully, will solve this problem. Or, or is there a way to to maybe solve it more readily available? Well, the great expert on how to influence the masses was Dr. Goebbels. And you should read some of his work. And uh, the government has a huge power. You know, basically, the the people in America should be 100% on the side of Elon Musk because he is trying to kind of show that uh, Twitter was an instrument of the government to influence people. But actually, the majority disagrees with that view. They are against him. It's the same. I have no sympathy whatsoever for Donald Trump. <coughs> and I actually think that he is a, you know, a, a useless kind of a character. Uh, no manners, uh, no refinement, no culture, no, no knowledge about anything. Is an arrogant twit. But at least he fights the Democrats and the uh, kind of widespread leftist view in America. But then they go and attack him and they get the district attorney to in to essentially sue him. And that the majority of people think uh, it's quite okay. I would the problem of democracy. Uh, this was discussed already in uh, Greece more than three thousand years ago. Is that it becomes mob rule, the mob. If you look at old Western movies, the mob is the mob in small towns of the West that goes and lynches people on small evidence because someone says, oh, he's a criminal. He did it. So they say right away. They don't ask deep questions. And uh, this is for me very disturbing. I, I think democracy is an institution that will fail massively, not a little, massively, much worse than, say, the aristocrats and the royalties in Europe, it will end up in a huge mess. In a huge mess. And you, and you know, everybody is evil who doesn't have democracy in the world. It's like the Americans. They had the dream to introduce democracy in Sudan. <laughs> yeah, you have to go to Sudan to believe that someone who would be eager to introduce democracy there. They never had democracy in 5,000 years. And in some countries, they're quite happy not to have democracies, but they have governments, you know, kings and the feudals, who, if they mess up things too badly, their heads are chopped off. Whose head do you want to go and chop off in Washington? They all say, I was told to do so. It's not my fault. It was based on the science that I received that I took these measures. And under those circumstances at that time, it was the best I could do. They all uh, negate any responsibility. This is the worst system you can have. It's the same in the corporate world. People who fail, they get a pension and they can go and walk somewhere else. Yeah, those are very important points, I think, to consider. Um, I want to end on this. 
what do you because obviously during during the pandemic there were all sorts of wild restrictions people getting locked down people forced to take medical interventions or lose their job lose their livelihood this was very prevalent in canada societal stigma being placed on people it does seem that it's let up in a lot of part of the world's travels open again the a lot of the mandates are gone even in canada now you can enter and leave freely there's no more masking but do you think that governments are now planning their next step? Do you think they'll create another big crisis to expand their powers once again? And what do you see that crisis being? Is it going to be the climate change agenda? Is it going to be a financial collapse and an intro introduction of maybe a CBDC and a universal basic income? How, how do you see the, the next move of the, the powers that be coming into play here? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know how evil governments can become so i wouldn't be able to tell you what that uh, what the next measure is but it could be either and uh, but it's not going to be a move towards more freedom for people it's gonna it's going to be a move towards less freedom and more control and more centralized control but i always say that if you really are concerned about this you should move to disorganized countries. Because if you live in a disorganized country, the central government can say, oh, we're implementing this. But the local police force in a small village, they don't care. Uh, they get bribed by the nightclubs or pubs and restaurants and so forth. So their life is much freer. Yeah, that 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 is why I came to the Balkans. You summed it up. It's it's disorganized. Nobody can implement anything. You know, they they tried to pass a law in Croatia not too long ago. I think it was a few years ago that no more smoking in cafes. We're not allowed to have smoking in cafes anymore. And everybody just ignored it. The cafe owners ignored it. Patrons ignored it. And then the law just went away. So um, I, I think that's that's very good advice to just go somewhere where they're never well, able to implement. The Croatians are very courageous people. And they're very good sportsmen. They play soccer very well. <laughs> yes, yes. But, but the point is really, uh, I would own uh, precious metals, of course. But I, I suppose that stocks uh, in inflationary times and in times of money depreciation, stocks perform better, especially asset stocks perform better than bonds and cash and uh, among the precious metals if someone is aggressive uh, i'd just like to point out that say the gold price is at the present time near an all-time high but precious metal stocks most of them are very depressed compared to the previous highs now it, there is an explanation for this and this and partly it's because the management of the miners are, are, are very bad. I mean, let's face it. <laughs> There's a horrible characters running <laughs> mining companies. But uh, some mining companies, they have a lot of value. And as you have seen in recent weeks and months, the large miners, they need to expand their reserves. And so they're buying smaller miners. And that trend will continue. That's so there are great lots advice, of takeover yeah. candidates. Yeah, absolutely. I've been hearing a lot about that as well from different guests I've been speaking to. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. Before I let you go, for those who want to learn more, could you tell us about the Gloom, Boom and Doom report and, and where people can find that? Well, the website is called uh, gloomboomdoom.com. All in one word, gloom boomdoom.com uh, and the newsletter I have two one is a bit more sophisticated and more uh, or directed towards high net worth individuals and institutions than one is more market timely and uh, I mean <laughs> it's very difficult for me to say I recommend them both because they're <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah. uh, like every forecast, some forecasts are good and some are not so good and so forth. But uh, in general, 
my strategies of diversification have not been optimal, but they have preserved the assets of people. And I, it's not that I'm bullish about gold today and three months later I'm negative and so on. I have consistently what? warned that the central banks are instruments to destroy the Western financial system and the wealth of nations. Deliberately, deliberately, they know that money printing is bad. There are hundreds of examples in history where money printing has led to disasters, and yet they implemented these policies. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mark, and sharing all your wisdom. I'll put a link to the Gloom Boom Doom report in the description below for anybody who wants to check that out. And, thank you uh, very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for joining us today, Mark. My pleasure. Take care.